Well, good morning again, friends. This is Pastor David Packer from International Baptist Church in Stuttgart, Germany. And we are going through the seven letters to seven churches. Today, we are looking at the letter to the church in Thyatira, or Thyatira, or Thyatira. You can choose whichever way you want to pronounce this name of this church. Uh, but it's in second chapter of Revelation, verses 18 down to the end of the chapter. We're going to read our text in just a minute and go through it bit by bit. As we have the other text, we're looking at how Christ describes himself, how he evaluates the church, and then the overcomer, how those people in this situation can overcome. As we mentioned throughout this series, this is seven letters to seven churches, and this number seven indicates the, the complete picture of the churches throughout the church age. This is from the day of Pentecost until the return of Christ. We are in the church age today. Sometimes people have looked at this as though it's a panoramic view of church history. And this would be the era of Thuatira. This is from the uh, from about 600 AD to the Reformation, to leading up to the Reformation. And sometimes we call that the Dark Ages. It wasn't all dark. There were some good things that happened uh, during that time. Uh, but we see that what this text is dealing with is the issue of moral compromise. Last week we looked at doctrinal compromise, and this week we're looking at moral compromise. Actually, the two go hand in hand. Uh, when we compromise doctrinally, we will also compromise morally. Uh, now, let me just give a general introduction into this issue of morality or philosophies of morality. Throughout the centuries, there have been endless uh, number of people that have come up with some philosophy of morality. So let me just mention a few of those that maybe you have, you could be familiar with or you may have heard about. Now, first of all, there is the biblical position, biblical law. What does the Bible say? We should obey it. Uh, but there's also, uh, there's Kantian. This is from Immanuel Kant, a uh, categorical imperative. Uh, that is his idea, that there is an absolute requirement uh, that must be obeyed in all circumstances. It's very similar to biblical law. In fact, many have, many have identified uh, what Kant taught as very similar, if not identical, to biblical law. That is, there is a moral absolute, and we must obey that moral absolute. But then we see there are many other ideologies that have come on. And on this day and this age, many are familiar with situational ethics. And uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, there's also this idea of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is used by many of the communist states. And this is the moral uh, concept that means that the right thing to do is whatever would bring the greatest good to the greatest number. Of course, you can see that's a slippery slope because who is determined? Who is to determine what's the greatest good for the greatest number? Uh, that has led to abuse of power and sometimes even genocides uh, against other people. And then there's consequentialism, proportionalism. Proportionalism has this idea: it is never right to go against a principle unless there's a proportionate reason that would justify it. Again, a very slippery slope. In other words, you should always obey your principles, except when you shouldn't. Uh, and uh, who's to say what's right or wrong? It's the moral relativism that uh, we're seeing in the modern philosophies in the last few centuries. Now, when it comes to situation ethics, situation simply says it depends on the situation. What's right and wrong, it entirely depends on the situation. Many Christians have taken up situation ethics and, and they said that the guiding principle should be love or agape love. That should be the guiding principle. If you intend to love someone and care for them, then that's all that matters. And how you do that is immaterial. Uh, but it has set up many very confusing and immoral scenarios. For example, Joseph Fletcher is one of those who promoted this teaching. He is often called the father of situation ethics. Uh, but he was, a, he was an Episcopal priest. He was born in 1905, died in 1991. Uh, later, he became an atheist even. But he had this idea that even, even uh, agape love uh, could also justify abortion, uh, killing of infants or infanticide, uh, euthanasia, all of these things could be justified if the situation were right on the argument of this is an expression of love. 
Um, well, you're a very slippery slope. Well, we see in the Bible there are moral absolutes. There's things that are always wrong. And God gave us the Ten Commandments in order to guide us and us we would know what we are to do and, and trust Him in all circumstances. Um, it's not a matter of if I just mean well that it's okay. Uh, rather, I should do what is right and uh, take the Bible at face value and obey it. Um, there are going to be situations where it depends on what's right or wrong. I mean, always you have those situations in life. Uh, but it's we are to be guided by God's moral principles. See, God calls us to be holy. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, this is a consistent message that we are not merely to believe in God and believe in grace and then do whatever we want. Often grace is used as an excuse for immoral and irresponsible living. But grace, receiving God's grace, should lead us to live holy and pure lives for His glory. That's what it means. To receive grace means to live for Him. In the Old Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the writings of the apostles, we see this principle. God says, be holy just as I am holy. That's our standard, Jesus Christ, His holiness, and we're to maintain that at all times. Now, let's look at our text. We're in the second chapter, and we're in the letter to the church in Thuatira, verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thuatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Let's stop there just for a second. Christ describes himself as the Holy One. His eyes like flaming fire, blazing fire. That has the idea of a purifying gaze. Um, the fire is associated with purifying in the, New, in the Bible, in the New Testament. Uh, and it was the idea of fire burning up that which was impure. And it has the idea that his gaze, through his word, by his spirit, he looks into our soul, convicts us of sin. And he, he leads us to repentance and to receiving his forgiveness, receiving his cleansing. That's what he desires us to do. First John 1, 9 and 10, if we confess our sins, uh, God is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our hearts. Uh, so we are to listen to his voice confess our sins, and receive their forgiveness. His eyes are like a blazing fire that penetrates into our hearts and our souls. But then the next statement about his feet are like burnished bronze. Uh, again, that's apocalyptic language uh, that is a symbol of stability. It means he knows where he stands. He's not going to change. He's not going to change his doctrine, his teaching, nor his moral absolutes. He knows where he stands, and he will not change. He's not a God that changes like, like shifting shadows. He is steady. He is consistent in his character, in his standard, in his holiness. Well, this is a wonderful statement about who Christ is for us. And as his followers, we should simply seek to obey him and follow him. Years ago, after I came as pastor here at the church, we adopted a new constitution. And in that constitution, have a, a, a church covenant. It, it's one of the most common church covenants among Baptists throughout the world. Uh, but in that standard of morality, it simply described the character of Christ. What are we to do? How are we to act? And um, when we were going through the process of looking at it, uh, one of the members of the church came to me and, and said, this standard is too high. No one can do that. Uh, and I responded, well, that's the standard of the Bible. That's the standard of Jesus Christ. Uh, we must maintain this standard. Surely we're going to fail. And we need to come to him, confess our sins, receive his forgiveness. But we must maintain this standard. We can't put a standard and say, uh, my, my goal is to be not so bad. No, God's standard is holiness. And that is what we must do. Well, they didn't like my answer. They eventually left the church. But that's the biblical requirement. We must aim for holiness and aim to be all we can be for God by His Spirit, by the guidance of His Word, with the encouragement of our brothers and sisters in Christ. But still, that's the standard. Now let's look and see the evaluation of Christ of this church at Thuatira. He says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are doing 
uh, that you are now doing more than you did at first. Well, that was a good statement. They had persevered in service. They had actually grown in their Christian activity. They were doing more. Uh, they had grown. I didn't say we're going to do less. We're going to do more. And that's a great ambition for any Christian and any church to continue to grow in service. Some churches and some Christians become content and they say, I- I'm doing all I want to do and that's all I'm going to ever do. But every Christian, Every church should seek to do more. Every year, seek to do more. Seek to grow. Seek to reach more people. And never be content with saying, we're just going to stop right here. Uh, We need to continue to grow, continue to share the gospel, continue uh, to love one another, continue to seek to grow in our knowledge, in our wisdom, in our maturity, in our faith, in our giving, in our numbers. Continue to grow uh, each year. Become more and more in Christ. But then he says this, nevertheless, I have this against you. He has something that's a problem with the church. And this is this issue of moral compromise. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Um, Well, this is a statement of uh, moral failings of the church. Uh, The doctrinal failings also lead to moral failings. But here in this situation, the moral failings come first. Uh, that the church had failed, and he knew they had failed. Now, if we look at it historically, from a historical picture, we're going to say this is the church uh, during the Dark Ages, leading up to the Reformation, and we can see there were terrible moral failings during those years. In fact, in many times, uh, the church was led by people who really had no faith themselves. Uh, It was not uncommon to hear cardinals and even popes and and bishops to say such things as how profitable is the myth of Jesus of Nazareth. They didn't even believe themselves. Uh, But they made a lot of money in wearing these wonderfully beautiful robes and holding positions and leading in the exercise of the rituals of the church. Uh, But they had no faith themselves, and this is a great tragedy. Now, there were pockets of very devout faith. Uh, We see many of the devotional writings of the church are very inspiring, even to this day, that came out of that period. We will go into all the theologians or all the devotional writings, but let me mention just one. Thomas Akempis, uh, he lived around Duisburg and Dusseldorf in that area. Uh, He was actually, uh, ethnically, he was Dutch, not German. But he wrote this wonderful book, um, The Imitation of Christ, and it's still being used today. One of the most widely read books in all the all the world. Um, so we see others coming out of that. Martin Luther, for example, Philip Melanchthon, uh, they came out of that. We're going to look next week at the Reformation. But also John Wycliffe and John Hus, uh, we see some great bright lights of faith and devotion during that time. But still, the church as a whole uh, was a an apostate church, uh, not believing and uh, not living uh, the faith. Now, uh, he mentions this bed of suffering, and uh, we don't know all that that means, but as we mentioned over the last few weeks, sin leads to consequences. And if we are going to be immoral, especially in the area of sexual immorality, uh, there are very likely going to be diseases that will uh, contract and we will spread. So he's, he's warning them. He says, don't do that because that's not how I created the world. I created the world so one man would be married to one woman and they would be faithful to one another their entire lives. Uh, and when you are sexually immoral, it will not work out well for you or for the world. We're also aware that the bubonic plague or the Black Death came into the church at that time. In fact, we see that was a turning point in the church because uh, it, to deal with the crisis of people dying, uh, they had to deal with this issue of death in a Christian context, and many of the priests died. Others were unwilling to, to offer a last rites to a dying soul. So the Catholic Church actually made this provision. They said, you know, if you don't have a priest, if you'll simply confess Christ, 
you'll still be saved. And that was a precursor to the Reformation because then they began thinking, now wait a minute, if the church can do that during a crisis, why can't it do that uh, at other times? And what is the truth? The Bible was hidden from the people. So it was a time of moral compromise and moral bankruptcy in the church. Although there were pockets of great light, uh, there was a lot of darkness. Now for us today, though, we also live in a time where many people, even though they call themselves Christian, compromise their faith. We see the acceptance of some things very clearly taught against in the Bible. Uh, homosexuality, for example. Uh, to have homosexual desires, uh, they may come from different sources, and that can be a very complicated development in someone's life. Uh, but the Bible clearly says that homosexual behavior is not the will of God. And we can expect God to give us strength and grace uh, and to be able to overcome all those desires. Uh, I spoke with a, woman, with a man years ago who was not homosexual at all. He was heterosexual. Uh, and he thought that he just had to, had to have sex with, with, uh, with women. He just said, I've got to do this. And he, he says, because of my nature. And, and he claimed to be a Christian. He and I prayed together, and I counseled with him, but he said, it's just because I'm Italian. He happened to be Italian. I'm Italian, I have to do these things. And I said, I didn't think that was an excuse. Uh, I thought that he could, by the power of God, resist temptation. Uh, and he and I lost contact. I don't know what happened to him, but it's still a, a picture of the excuses people give. I just got to do this. I can't stop. But let me tell you, friend, you can. You can, in the power of Christ, you can. There's no sin that God cannot forgive and there's no addiction to sin or, or no weakness in an area or no satanic stronghold that God by his truth and by his spirit cannot enable you to overcome. God is a God of power and might and he can lead us to say no uh, to addictions, no to sin and live in the freedom of the spirit and the power and the authority of his word. Now, Let's go into this uh, the statement about the one who will overcome. He says, Now I say to the rest of you in Theatira, uh, to, this is verse 24, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, in, uh, uh, private organization, secret organization, learning great secrets and intrigue, thinking that's the way you get spiritual power. All of this is contradiction to the truth and it doesn't lead to the freedom of Christ. Uh, but he says, if you have not given into that, uh, he says, I, I, he's going to tell you about how you can experience freedom. Uh, but he makes this comment. It's in a parenthesis in the NIV. It says, I will not impose any other burden on you. Now, let me just say a word about the gentleness of our Savior. Uh, we are not to go beyond what is written or go beyond what is commanded. Uh, we're to uphold and teach and and uh, and live out the faith, what is in the Bible, but we're not to go beyond that. And here we see these gentle words of Christ that say, I'm not going to impose on you uh, anything that, that you may have been taught or been, been warned of, you're going to have to do. No, uh, I will just say, you follow me and I'll bless you and I'll guide you. That's all that's required. You follow me. He says, hold on to what you have until I come. And there is a wonderful promise that we are simply to obey him every day, uh, to live every day following Christ, and he'll guide us, he'll lead us. Now, verse 26, he says, To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, again, a statement of a complete commitment, does my will to the end, it means that we commit ourselves to follow Christ uh, we have this doctrine the Presbyterians call the perseverance of the saints. But let's be clear, it's not the perseverance of the saints. It is the perseverance of the Holy Spirit in believers. That's what happens when he comes into us. Uh, we do his will because he never leaves us. He doesn't give up on us. He says this, three things he promises. He said, I will give authority over the nations. And this is a statement to the victory we have in Christ, to his authority, to share in the glorious victory. We see in Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9, speaks about this prophetic word of Christ ruling the nations with the rod of iron. And then that very phrase, the rod of iron, is the idea 
of the authority, the irresistible power of God uh, to enforce his will and to do what he, what he says he will do. Uh, God leads us by his spirit. And, and friend, in, in heaven, he will make us perfect. And he wants to do this now in our life. And every part of our life that we surrender to him, that he will take that and he will bless it. He will grow it. He will mature it. And that's what he's doing. He is getting us ready for eternity in heaven. So this idea of a rod of iron means the irrepressible, righteous, loving power of God in our life. Uh, now, he wants us to choose his authority. He wants us to choose his authority. He wants us to say, Lord, because of your love, I, I trust you with my heart and my life and my choices. I'm going to put my life in your hands. Uh, now, let me, let me simply say something that's very important. I, I feel impressed that many people in our church that, that I preach to weekly are faced daily with uh, compromising situations. Uh, when you're facing a compromising situation, whether it's in your private life about what you're going to do or where you're going to go, or maybe in your professional life or maybe your family life, in those situations, it's very important to simply trust the Lord and say, I'm going to do the right thing and trust the Lord with results. As God leads me, I'm going to do the right thing uh, and trust him. I'm going to be right. I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to be faithful. And I'm going to follow him. So when you face these consequent, face these confusing and uh, and um, uh, even very difficult temptations, uh, when you face Satan's deception, uh, and you feel that stronghold of Satan has built up in your life, uh, bearing down on you, remember that in Christ we have freedom. Uh, we shall know the truth of Christ. We shall know the teachings of Christ, and His truth. His teachings will set us free. And by Spirit, we can live above these things. Now, the final thing is I will uh, give him the morning star. Morning star refers to the planet Venus. And in the morning, it's very bright in the sky often. It's a precursor to the, uh, to the bright day. And the morning star is the promise of the return of Christ, the coming kingdom. And in these situations, whenever we're faced with uh, with a compromise, a Christian community, morally compromised, uh, we can trust in God and trust that Christ is returning and we can live in victory and in peace. He will give us that assurance and we'll live confidently before him. Now, uh, let me just mention about a couple of these people I mentioned earlier that were bright lights during this dark period of the Middle Ages. Uh, John Wycliffe, he was uh, from England. 1320 to 1384, he lived. He died uh, from a stroke. 54, year, 50, excuse me, 64 years of age, he died of a stroke. Uh, but in 1382, two years before his death, he translated the Bible into English. And see, the Roman Catholic Church uh, wanted to 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 suppress the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, the Vulgate, which was actually originally written to put the Bible in the language of the people, uh, got to be the only official Bible that could be taught, but it was not understandable by the people of that day. It had been translated in the 5th century, uh, and uh, a few hundred years later, people didn't know what it was saying. The priest had to study Latin, but the common person could not understand it. Uh, so uh, John Wycliffe, translated the Bible into English. And his translation, even to this day, was influential uh, in so many areas of our English translations today. Uh, and um, his, his affirmation was this, uh, that only the Bible was the reliable guide to the faith. Uh, and that's exactly what we believe here in our church, that the Bible is uh, the sole guide, that is S-O-L-E, the only guide to faith and practice for the church and for the believer. And it shows us how to live, what to believe, and how to follow Christ. Uh, John Hoos, in 1369, he lived till, born in 1369, lived to 1415. Well, he was active uh, as a Reformation, as a pre-Reformation leader. This is a hundred years before Martin Luther came along. Uh, but he was active in modern day Czechoslovakia, or Czech Republic, uh, and uh, he was active in Bo uh, Bohemia, Moravia, and he was uh, really God's instrument 
to teach the truth, that he simply wanted to have a biblical community, a biblical faith, people that gathered together to follow the Christ of the Bible. Uh, and they did not go beyond what was written. Uh, they didn't stop short of it either. And he was opposed and was uh, burnt at the stake as ashes sprinkled uh, into the river. And uh, and he, he was uh, supposedly extinguished and, and uh, forgotten uh, all about. But we still remember him today. And his followers continued for many, many years. And, and he and Wycliffe laid a foundation uh, for Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon and others that came along in the 16th century to build upon. So there were some bright lights. And whenever someone stands for the truth, no matter what, stands for the truth, God is going to bless that person. And God can give him peace and joy. So I pray that we'll be that as a church. We'll not go along with the world. We'll stand for the truth. We'll follow Christ. I pray that you'll be that as a believer. Your family will be that as a family of believers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your love. We pray, Lord, that we may stand strong for you and what you teach, what your, what your word says, and also that we would live it out in our faith daily. Uh, we would stand uh, morally and ethically in your, on your word and obey you. Give us the strength to be faithful to you. Uh, give us the honesty to confess our sins daily. And give us the grace where we understand we are accepted through our faith by your love and by the payment of our sins by Christ. Now, Lord, we pray that you bless us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you today.